सही बारे you so much that he redeemed you. He sent his son that by the power of his own hands he saved us. Yes. 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 Now, now, I guess that only means something to those who recognize you needed to be saved. Amen. When, when you are not disillusioned about the things that you did, then you can't do nothing but appreciate the fact that God's love for you wiped it all out. The hole that you dug for yourself, God just filled right on you. Can, can, can I go one step Thank further? Yes. The shovel you keep using. Oh, well, come on. Come on, Pastor. He's got a bulldozer mm -hmm. to counteract you. your shovel. Yes, to fill in everything that you dig out. Mm -hmm. That's how much he loves you. He didn't love you. He loves you. Yes. Redemption is still occurring. Yes. 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 I'm redeemed. Yes. Amen. Yes. By the love. If, if, if y'all get nothing out of the message I'm about to share, that right there should have yes. been somebody's yes. message. Yes. That he loves you to the point of redemption. Well, it's preaching time. Amen. 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 For those of you all that have your Bibles, if you'd be so kind as to go to the Old Testament book of Genesis. You don't have far to go. If you, if you need a Bible, let one of our ministry technicians know. They'll be sure to get one to you. We'll be going to Genesis chapter number three. So for many of you, it may be page number three in your Bible. <laughs> once you have Genesis chapter three, once you rest on your feet as we prepare for the reading of God's word. Genesis chapter 3, we'll be starting in verse number 6. Won't you signal by saying amen once you got it? Amen. If you need a second, say hold on. Sounds like we are all together on this one. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6 is where we'll be begin, but it is our custom to read our confession, which is on the screen. I may drop out, but you continue on, and then we'll get to our scripture focus for today. Let's read. This is my Bible, the Word of God. Today, the Word of God will transform me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Word of God, according to Genesis chapter number 3, starting at verse number 6, I'm going to be reading a different translation, which was provided with our series, so that we might be able to continue on even through our studies this week. But continue in whatever version you may have, I would assume that for the majority of us it's NIV. This is the B clause of Genesis 3, 6, and it reads this way. So Eve ate some of the fruit. <clears throat> then she also gave some to her husband Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Immediately, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover up themselves. Then they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God amongst the trees. But God called out to Adam, Where are you? Adam replied, I heard you coming, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then God asked, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam said, you gave me this woman, and she gave me the fruit, so I ate it. Then God said to Eve, why did you do this? Eve 
replied, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So God said to Eve, you will have greater trouble in pregnancy and great pain in childbirth. And though you'll desire your husband, he's going to lord it over you. Then God said to Adam, because you also disobeyed me and sinned with your wife, the ground you work is now cursed. Yeah. And though you'll get to eat what you planted, your fields will have weeds and thorns and thistles. And for the rest of your life, you will have to sweat and work hard to get your food until you yourself are returned to the dirt that I used to create you. As you reach across the aisles and grab your name by the hand, I would that you would consider the theme around this message for today. Facing the fears that ruin relationships. Facing the fears that ruin relationships. Eternal God, our Father, it's in the precious, holy, and matchless name of he who is our Christ that we come to say thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for the privilege, the honor, the joy that is ours for gathering in this place around your word according to your purpose. Now, God, allow your word to come alive in us. Allow your word to be deposited in us in such a way that it yields forth fruit, that it ends up bringing forth a harvest that is pleasing to you, that ultimately ends up growing us, that we might benefit the purpose for which we were created. Spirit of the living God. Fall fresh in this place. Throw your weight around. Do a new thing in us that we might become new. Yes. Neighbor, I squeeze your hand as a sign yes. of letting you know that I am believing God yes. for you. Yes. I'm specifically believing for your transformation. Yes. I'm believing yes. that God is turning some things around. Yes. That he's changing some things in you. And he's working some things out for you. I don't know what it is that you stand in the need of, but I do believe right now that God is changing you to be able to hold the capacity of the things that God has made a promise to you for. That when the smoke clears and the dust settles, as these words that are in God's word find root in your heart and in your life, you would have grown to the capacity of the promise for which he created you. So put an expectation out there that you are closer than you've yeah. ever been before yeah, right. to what you know God has said your life is supposed yeah. to look yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. So do not fear the terror by night. Yeah, right. Do not fret when the rain falls. Yeah. For after the clouds clear and the sun mm -hmm. shines, you will find that that which God promised is about to come budding yeah. up yeah. out of yeah. your yeah. life. Yeah. Just as winter turns to spring and that which was sleep wakes up, you're about to walk into your season. Yeah. Yeah. Do what only you yeah. can do in this place, God. We thank you in advance for it's in the name of Jesus and all of God's children said, Amen. amen and amen. You may have your seat in the presence of our God. I don't know about you, but I feel all right. Yes. Not, not, not only do I feel all right, I feel an anticipatory praise. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay, let, let, let me yes. say it again. I feel an anticipatory praise. You know what that means? That means that I don't know exactly what God's about to do, but I feel like God's about to do something, and I just got to say, hallelujah, in advance. I, I just... I'm not going to wait until I see it. I know that he's already done enough in me, for me, and through me to know that if he saved me for such a time as this, I'm about to walk into my time. Uh, it, it, it's been too rough. It's been too hard. It's been too difficult. And it should have taken me out. And the simple fact that I'm still here is a sign that God's plan is working. Yeah. Oh, I got to get to this message. Can I say that one more time? God's plan is working. Because I should not have survived the sick. I, I, I should have lost my mind last week. I, I should have taken somebody else out yesterday. But the simple fact that I'm still here is an indication that God's plan is working. He didn't save me for nothing. As a matter of fact, Mother Webb, he saved me for something. And I'm getting closer than ever before. 
I, I just needed to get that out of my spirit so that I could walk through this text because transformation is happening. Yes, 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 do, do you believe that? Do you sense that? Do you feel that? Did anybody just come out of a week of hell? Yeah. I, 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 I got I to get out of this and get to the message. But 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 if for, for those of you all that were here last week, I warned you as we finished that, that as, as we uh, close out the message on emotional hell, our emotions, how we feel. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was a prep message. Uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. it, it was an anticipatory message. It was one that was designed to give you the tools in advance of the week you were going to face. Did anybody have an emotional week? Yes. 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 Did, did, did anybody get caught up in your feelings a little bit? You had to catch yourself? <laughs> if, if, if that's you, God's plan is working. Uh -huh. Thank you. It's working. Amen. It's working. If your emotions were kind of all over the place, yeah. if you kind of got hit by some things and you asked, what God is this? Oh, it's Thank working. Thank you. So, so, so this week, uh, we, we, we've got another message to sow. Y'all all right? Yeah. We, we, we've been looking at transforming. And we've been looking at it in, in seven key areas of our life. We've looked at spiritual health, we've looked at physical health, we looked at mental health, and as I just mentioned last week, we looked at emotional health. This week, our assignment is to look at relational health. Transforming your relationships, how to make your relationships better. I, I want us to look at diffusing the fears that ruin relationships. To do that, we're going to look at a very familiar story in the book of Genesis. Today, we're going to look at the very first couple, Adam and Eve, because that, my friends, is where all of the challenges began. Amen. Amen. To create the universe, God wanted uh, to create an environment where the earth could exist. Because God wanted to create a sustaining environment for human beings he ultimately ended up creating the universe and then created the earth because the ultimate goal, Mo, was he wanted to create a family. Right, right. Do, do you understand? Yeah. That, that, that if God hadn't wanted a family, he wouldn't have created the universe. But he made it all because he wants you and I in his family. Right. So, so he made Adam and he put him in the Garden of Eden, a perfect paradise. Adam had everything he could possibly want, except we learn through the text that Adam was lonely. Adam noticed that all of the animals had mates, but there was no mate for him to be found. I think quite honestly, Chris, that God did this intentionally. He wanted Adam to realize what he would need in his own life. But not only that, I think God made Adam, and then he thought, I can do better. <laughs> and he made me. I, I, I need the ladies to rock with me. Rock with me just for a moment. So God made Adam out of the dust of the ground, out of the earth, and he creates Adam out of dirt, and then he creates Eve out of Adam. This, by the way, is why men don't mind getting dirty. <laughs> okay. and, and oftentimes women do. The, the reason why men don't mind getting dirty and, and, and women uh, don't necessarily like it too tough is because men were created out of the dirt. So it shouldn't surprise anybody when men do dirt. Oh, that's too much. We don't mind getting money. We don't mind getting messy. We don't mind getting in the midst of a bunch of dirt. Women, however, weren't created out of the dirt. The Bible says that they were taken from the rib of Adam. Hmm. There, there's a lot of uh, symbolism in this. God created Adam's helpmate, his partner for life, his wife, out of his rib. He, he didn't take her from his feet so that he would lord over her. He didn't take her from his head so that she would lord over him. But he took his wife from his side 
where she would be his equal, his partner. He took her from his rib so that she would be close to his heart, symbolizing that she would be deeply loved. Amen. There's, there's so much more that I could say about that, but that's not where we need to go this, this day. God put Adam to sleep. He created the woman. When Adam wakes up, he sees Eve in all of her glory. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, it's important for us to get that picture because right then and there, according to the text, things went along pretty great for quite a little while. You know, the relationship between man and woman was, was really good because there was no sin. There was no sadness. Mac, there was no sickness, no sorrow, no suffering, no deceit. There was no lying. There was no manipulation or jealousy. None of these things were in their relationship. Mm -hmm. They were the only couple who had the perfect relationship. Mm -hmm. The only. Right. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Then our text of focus today comes into play. Yeah. <laughs> Satan comes to Eve and he lies to her and says... Didn't God say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? <laughs> now, of course, we understand and know that God didn't say that. Right. He said that you can only not eat from one tree, tree in the garden. Mm -hmm. Just one tree is off limits. He put that one tree there in an effort to give or provide choice because God wants us to always choose him. God always wants us to choose to love him. Him above loving anything else. But he did not put statistically more obstacles in his way. He only put one. <laughs> There's so much more I could say about that, but I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> Satan says, God's lying to you. You're not going to die if you eat of the fruit of the tree. In fact, you'll be wise as God. You'll be God. Notice this. Every temptation comes down to that basic issue. I want to be God. <laughs> Satan never tempts us to be like him. He never says, do this temptation and you'll be like me. You'll be evil. But Satan says, do this and you'll know better than God. Do this. Because God is old-fashioned. He's, he's out of date. God doesn't want you to be happy. You're God. And Eve fell for that lie. Right. In our text, we see three basic fundamental fears that pop up in every single relationship. You can use this, uh, what we're going to go through today in your life groups this week. You can use it in your marriages. You can use it in your relationship with your boyfriend, your girlfriends, or your friends. You can use it wherever you go, where you're at work. There are three fundamental fears that started in the first relationship when sin entered, and they're still present in your life and in everybody else's <laughs> life, and they're damaging and they're destroying the potential of every relationship. So let's get right into it. Y'all all right? Amen. How are fears ruin relationships? Number one, the first fear we learn is this. It's the fear of exposure. The fear of exposure makes me distant. The fear of exposure makes me distant. Why can't I get close to people? I'd like to be closer to my wife. I'd like to be closer to my husband. I'd like to have a more intimate relationship, a more soul-passionate intimacy of partnership. But why can't I get close to the people in my life? Well, because my fear of exposure is making me distant. Here's the truth. There are a lot of things you don't like about you. Mm -hmm. Again, I say that. I know it's true. Mm -hmm. You don't like it about you, and because you don't like it about you, you certainly don't want anybody else to know it. You don't want anybody else to see it. The things that we don't accept about ourselves, we have a fear will not be accepted by others, yes. so we keep our distance. Yes. The closer people get, the more they see our blemishes, the more yes. they see our mistakes, our faults, our failures, our weaknesses. So we keep people at a distance because of the fear of exposure, that people would know that we 
are, are not necessarily everything we presented ourselves to be. Come on, Pastor. Yeah. And, and the things that we don't like about ourselves, we don't want to share because they might reject us. Yeah. In verse 9 of our text here in Genesis uh, chapter number 3, it says this. God called Adam. Why are you hiding? Mm -hmm. And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Mm -hmm. let, let me say a couple of things uh, to you right now. Uh, before we move this thing a little bit further. Whenever God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> he, he, he wasn't asking for his benefit. He was asking the question for Adam's benefit because he wants Adam to own it up. Right. He wants Adam to man up. He wants Adam to be a man and accept responsibility for the fact that he had run and now he is hiding. But let me say this, as you're pondering that in your own way. Any transformation in any area of your life, including relationships, only happens when you own up to the fact that they aren't what they ought to be. Yeah. Can I say that again? You can't transform anything you don't own. As long as you think you got a great marriage, it's going to not get any better. I, 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 I've got great friendships, well fine. As long as you're in denial, there's no recovery, there's no transformation. So it starts with us owning up and being honest to God and honest with ourselves that my relationships are not necessarily all that they could be. They could be a whole lot better than they are right now. Look, look at the phrase in the text where it says, I was afraid and I hid. Now it's important to notice that because they go together. I was afraid and I hid. Fear always causes us to hide. Yes. Yes. I, I, I wonder, where are you hiding from? Because you're afraid. What are you pretending not to know? What are you pretending is not a problem in your marriage? What are you pretending isn't a problem in your life? What are you pretending isn't a problem in your relationships because you're afraid of facing the truth? God doesn't want you to fake it. He wants you to face it. What are you pretending not to know? He said, I was afraid and I hid. Look also, I'm still in the text, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, look, at, look at the next phrase where it says that I was naked. <laughs> well, what does it mean to be naked? Well, he's talking about more than just physical nakedness. There's an emotional nakedness, too. Mm -hmm. To be naked means to be exposed. It means to be uncovered, to be vulnerable and uh, authentic. It means that you're out in the open and you're unprotected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know that you are never more vulnerable than you are when you're naked? Right. It's just all out there. Mm -hmm. there there's yeah. nothing to hide. <laughs> When we are afraid of nakedness, afraid of vulnerability, afraid of being open and honest with letting people see us, we're really fearful. Mm -hmm. And the fear of exposure makes us distant. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the deepest needs is to be loved. But one of the deepest fears is the fear of being seen for what you really are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want you to notice the damage that fear does to relationships. There are three stages that we see here in our text. And I want to go over those three before we move a little further. Y'all kind of quiet. Y'all all right? I, mean, I know y'all writing notes, but I, I don't know if I'm striking home or I'm striking out. <laughs> so every now and again, Wade, do something. Just let him know because anybody else looking at the videotape is going to be wondering, is he just preaching to himself? <laughs> There's three phases right here in the text. And phase number one is shame. Shame. The first phase is shame. In verse number seven of our text, once they disobeyed God, the first thing that entered their relationship was shame. The text says they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Fear is often based in shame. When you carry shame, you are easily embarrassed. And you and I both know that we'll do almost anything to avoid embarrassment. 
Embarrassment is a symptom that you're carrying unresolved shame in your life. Yes. Shame makes you more self-conscious. Yeah. Shame makes you more nervous. Shame makes you uh, fearful of being humiliated. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to avoid at all costs any yeah. shame because shame means that I would be mortified if anybody else would find out what uh, is really going on. You have any of those things in your life, it means that there is some shame that you haven't given to God to allow him to take it away. That's phase number one. Phase number one is shame. Phase number two is cover-up. Phase number two is the cover-up. What happens is when we feel ashamed, we try to conceal who we really are, our true selves. The B clause of verse number 7 of chapter 3 of Genesis says, So they sewed fig leaves together to cover up themselves. Do you see that? Yeah. Today we have uh, uh, all kinds of sophisticated ways to cover up who we really are. We, we don't use fig leaves anymore, but we do cover up all of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder in what way are you covering up your fears and your insecurities? Some people use humor. They're the class clown. But they don't let anybody get too close to them. So they're always throwing shade by showing jokes. <laughs> Maybe you, you try to cover up your insecurities by presenting the image that you're all put together. You've, you've got the right clothes. You've got the right accessories. you got the right wig. You drive the right car. You drive the right thing. You say the right things. You use the right words. You give the image that you're all put together, but in essence, you're not. You don't have it together at all. You don't have anything together in any sense of the word. But you keep trying to present this image that's really nothing more than you trying to cover up your fear. Today, a lot of people hide behind the image they present online. Yeah. If you read their Facebook page, and you look at their Twitter, or you look at the images on their Instagram, you would think they had the perfect life. They're, 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 they're absolutely all together, and everybody wants to date them. <laughs> Don't nothing go wrong with you in your life. You eat good, you go to great places. Stop pretending. Stop pretending that you have the perfect light. You're just faking it and you're really revealing more of your fears Amen. than anything else. The third phase, the third phase, we move from shame to cover up to the third phase, which is distance from God. I'm in verse 8 of the text. Verse 8 says this, then they hid from God amongst the trees. Years ago, there was a book that came out, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Really Am? And the answer to the question is just based on this. Because I may not like who I am. Many of us believe if I share who I really am, if I stop pretending that I am something that I'm not, if I share who I really am, you might not accept me. And then I'm out. I'm up the creek without a paddle. I'm, 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 I'm exposed because then you might actually reject me. The text says that they hid from God amongst the trees. This causes us now not only to become disconnected from other people, and that's why we have challenges in our relationships, but even greater than that, uh, this causes a disconnection from God, and that's why we have a challenge with our relationship with God. We, we not only start fearing other people, but then we start fearing God out of shame. God doesn't expect you to be perfect, but he does expect you to be honest. Yeah. Amen. Can I say that one more time and prayerfully it'll help liberate somebody? God is never expecting you to be perfect. He just is looking for you to be honest so that the first thing, the first fear is this. It's the fear of being exposed. And that causes me to become distant. The second fear we see in Adam and Eve is the fear of disapproval. Second thing is, my fear of disapproval makes me defensive. Oh gosh, are y'all still there? If the first fear made me distant, the fear of disapproval makes me defensive. Now we move from simply hiding and running and covering up 
to now being defensive, we start attacking other people back. We're not just hiding, we're hurling. We're not just excusing ourselves, we're accusing others. It's, it's in this stage when I have this fear of disapproval, I start pointing fingers at everybody else. That's when you hear people say, but you did. The more critical a person is, the more you know they fear disapproval. Yeah. I'll say that again. Wow. The more critical a person is, the more you know they're, 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 they fear disapproval. The more of a perfectionist a person is, the more they attack other people. They're always putting somebody else down. The more you know that a person is in fear of themselves, they always find themselves defensive and on the attack. Because that's the way that it shows up. The more I fear disapproval in my own life, the more I'm going to point out in other people's lives all of the things they're doing. Come on. We see it right there in verse number 12. I'm still in the text. Trust me, I haven't deviated. It says right here. God asks, did you eat what I told you not to eat? Adam answered, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit. So I ate it. Adam took it like a man. He blamed his wife. Not, 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 if you look even closer at the text, he, he's really not even blaming his wife. He's blaming God. You gave me this woman. If you hadn't made her, it's all my wife's fault. God, God if, if, if it weren't for that woman, she seduced me. She got me all messed up in my head. So, so, so Adam's not even blaming Eve. He's blaming God for his choices. He's passing the responsibility. All right, so before you get too excited, ladies, Eve wasn't too willing to accept responsibility either. She doesn't show up either. She doesn't woman up. But verse 13 of the text says, Eve said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So, so Adam blames his wife, and Eve blames the saint. See, my fear of disapproval makes me defensive. This happens in our marriage, in our relationships all the time. If anybody says anything to you, your wife says something that you feel uh, has a hint of disapproval, you immediately get defensive. And you either explain it, or you attack back, or you accuse, or you excuse, or you say something smart out your mouth. Uh oh. Mm, I ain't gonna get no help. Boy, I need some more preachers up here. Because I ain't got nobody Preach, for me today. My fear of exposure makes me distance. And my fear of disapproval makes me dis defensive. But there's a third fear that we see here with Adam and Eve, and, and it's the fear of losing control. My fear of losing control makes me demanding. My fear of losing control makes me demanding. The result of Adam and Eve's sin is that they lost control. They lost control of everything. They lost control of their future. They lost control of their destiny. They got kicked out of paradise. And now they're feeling totally out of control because they were. Right. They weren't controlling anything at this point. In this situation, my fear of losing control makes me demanding. Let me say it this way. The more out of control you fear, the more controlling you become. <laughs> you start bossing everybody around. You start making demands. You start protecting yourself. You start defending and demanding and demeaning. I start dominating. The more insecure you are, the greater the need to get your way. Now, here's, here's, here's the thing. If a really secure person, you don't need to have your way all the time. You just don't. It, it doesn't bother you. You don't have to have your way all of the time because you're secure. But if you're insecure, then, then you really have to have your way all of the time. 
And you fight for your way. You push for your way. You control for your way. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. Come on. Come on. Yeah. 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 You ain't got to say amen. Just sit there. Yeah. <laughs> You've already proven you ain't going with me today, so I'm going to go ahead and ride this thing out. <laughs> <laughs> in verse 16 is where God says to Eve, you'll have yearning for your husband. In other yeah. words, you're going to love your husband even though you both messed up, but he will lord it over you. The, the Berkeley version of the text says he'll dominate you. Okay, let me, just, let me just expose this text right here into the reality of the context of our lives. This is where the war of the sexes began. That's right. That's right. Right, right here in the text. All of the misunderstanding between men and women, husband and wives, boyfriend and girlfriends, all of the confusion, all of the conflict, all of the jockeying for power and position, yeah. all of the tick for that tack. Yeah. It all began right here. All of the bargaining. Who's going to be in control of this and who's going to run that? It all goes back to this situation right here in Genesis Amen. chapter 3. It was Amen. sin's entrance. Amen. Amen. There's no fun being in a relationship where you're not cooperating, but you're always competing for each other. God called us together today in an effort to teach us how to move from competition to cooperation in our marriages and in our relationships. When you're fighting each other, you're failing. Let me say that again. When you're fighting each other in a relationship, you are failing. The goal for us gathering together, this stage of transformation, is designed in an effort to teach us how to not fight each other, but join together so we can fight against the things that fight us. Yes. We're on the same team. Yes. So the question becomes, how do you do it? If you find these fears manifesting themselves in your life and in your relationships, what then do we say to these things? Now. What is the antidote that transforms a relationship that relieves these three fears, the fear of exposure and the fear of disapproval and the fear of losing control that causes me to be distant and defensive and demanding in relationships. Now, if you don't ever find yourself being distant and demanding and controlling in relationships, then go ahead and check on out. Go to sleep right now. <laughs> but if you find that that is you or that you're married to or you're connected to, pay close attention to the antidote. Amen. You there? Amen. There's only one antidote to fear. It's love. Yes. No. <laughs> There's only one antidote to fear, and it's love. Write this down. Learn to live in God's love. Hmm. As a matter of fact, make it personal. I must learn to live in God's love. That's the antidote. Yes, Amen. yes, yes, yes. In, in, in 1 John 4, 18, make sure you jot that down if you're taking notes. 1 John 4, 18, the first half of the verse says this. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Yes, yes, yes. If the fears have been creating the problem, Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. No fear. No fear. So if you want to get rid of the fear in a relationship, you've got to get God's love in the relationship. Amen. Amen. You want to get rid of the fear in your career? Get God's love there. If you want to get the fear out of your education or out of sports or whatever, you got to get God's love there. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Why? Because God's perfect love drives out all fear. Yes. Contrary to popular opinion, the opposite of fear is not faith. Amen. Amen. The opposite Amen. of fear is love. Amen. When you invite God's love into the front door of your heart, as we talked about last week, the heart being the center of your emotions, when you ask God's love into your heart through the front door, fear has to go out the back door. Because fear and love cannot live in the same house. When you let fear in the front door of your house, love goes out the back door. 
Whenever you're afraid, you're being, uh, you're, you're not in a position where you're able to be loved. Love casts out all fear. Have you ever noticed that when um, a, a, a building is burning, people will sit there and watch out of sheer fear? Sheer fear and the simple fact that people are afraid to go in there. But have you also noticed that in those contexts, if there was a mother standing outside of that burning building and her child was still in there, she would run into the building right. Right. to go get her child? Right. Do you know why? Because fear is overcome by love. Love is greater than fear. If you learn how to get God's love in, God will handle your fear. We have to live in God's love. That, that's the number one thing. The, the, the second thing, uh, the second part of the verse of 1 John 4, 18, the B clause says this. It is the thought of punishment that makes a person fearful. Amen. It's the thought of punishment that makes a person. Okay. What, what is the thought of punishment? It, it's the things that we think that have negative consequences. How many times have you been afraid to tell the truth because of the consequences? Not because you didn't know the truth, but you didn't express it because of the fear of the consequences of the truth. How many times have you been afraid because of the consequences? It's the thought of punishment or negative consequences that makes a person afraid. So how do you learn to live in God's love? Well, you do three, three things. If you'll do these three things, it'll transform your relationships. There's three things that we have to do daily in an effort to live in God's love that becomes the antidote of the fear that's ruining our relationships. Okay. Are y'all still tracking with me? Yeah. I know I've got a lot that I've said. I still have a little, bit, a little bit of ways to go. But if you stay with me, fear will not ruin another one of your relationships. Okay. Amen. Let, 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 me, let me just say this. Amen. Since God did not put you in this earth by yourself for you to show up to heaven and don't have nobody that like you. For, for you to get to where God is and there ain't nobody that can co-sign that they was with you in life. You know that as long as I got King Jesus theory, I don't need nobody else. I love the song. It kind of makes you shout just a little bit. But theologically... Come on, it's unacceptable. Amen. Amen. Because I have King Jesus, I should be able to accept everybody else. The closer I get to him should cause me to know how to navigate my life around you. I shouldn't excuse anybody for any reason. I should not accept dysfunction to function. So any relationship that is being ruined is because there's some fear in there. Yeah. And the antidote to that is learning how to get God's love more in my life because the more I get God's love in my life, the more I can love you. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, let me take it down just another note. The more I get God's love in my life, the more lovable I become. Because sometimes it ain't got nothing about how you accept people. You are unacceptable. Thank you so suchy much. Oh, I got walked to Thomas Spirit every now and then. That's a good old country saying. You just so suchy much. You think just because you don't like them. Baby, don't nobody like you. It ain't that difficult. You the issue. There are three things we have to do every day. Y'all all right? Y'all right with me? Here's the first thing. In an effort to live in God's love, every day I must surrender my heart to God. If I'm going to live in God's love every day, I have to surrender my heart to God. Last week, we talked about our emotions, and we said that the heart is the symbol of the center of our emotions. Yeah. So what we do every day, every morning when we wake up, we ask God before we start this day, God, I surrender the center of my emotions to you. God, I want you to be Lord of my feelings. I want you to control my mind and my emotions, my mind and my heart. I surrender it to you. I want you to fill me with your love. Yes. Amen. 
Before you go down your laundry list of the things that you need to address within any day with God. Before you make a request of any kind, Come on. ask God to first fill you with his love. Because without his love, you don't see right. You don't feel right. Without his love, you feel everything and it's generally wrong. God's love. The closer we get, the more love fills our heart. The further away we get from God, the more fear fills our heart. It's a simple equation. The closer, the more love comes in. The further away from God, Donna, the more fear comes in. So if you want to get rid of your fear, you've got to get close to God because perfect love casts out fear. Right. I want to get closer to God and cast out worry, the insecurity, the anxiety fears of those things. You know, I, I don't want to take it for granted, uh, and because I don't see y'all during the week, and I'm praying that after these 50 days of transformation, uh, you will not only see the value of making Sunday your Sabbath, but you'll make a commitment to, to using another day without within the week to, to grow. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen? Uh -huh. that, that everything doesn't have to be um, concentrated into Sunday, but you'll, uh -huh. you'll, you'll get to a place where it'll become important to you to have a day where you study the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe our Sunday morning encounters can be a lot shorter. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> maybe God won't have to pour in a week's worth of information <laughs> into one encounter. Hey, hey, can we spread yeah. some of this out? <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, that was just a personal pastoral note. But my point in saying that is just simply this, that, that if you are experiencing fear, anxiety, insecurity, mm -hmm. these are byproducts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of distance from God. Amen. Yeah. 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 See, we keep wanting to uh, address them in, in individual, isolated ways. Right. Right. When really the root cause the root is all cause. you have to deal oh, with. I don't have to deal with my insecurities and the fact that you don't like me and you don't like the way that I look and I end up changing my whole wardrobe, I end up changing my wig and everything else in an effort to suit you. All I really need to do is just grow closer to God. See, but I go on and spend all that money for people that ain't really paying me that much attention. Now let's just be very clear. Please look your best. <laughs> don't, don't just give up and just say, accept me as I is. No, baby, do, do, do something with that. Do, do something with that. Amen, like. But let that be a choice you make because you like you. Not because you are insecure and you're trying to please others. Because quiet as is kept, you'll never be able. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Do, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. That if we grow closer to God, we'll be able to address all of the things. In, in, in Job chapter 11, Job chapter 11, if you're taking notes, take this one down. Job chapter 11, verses 13 and 18 is a verse that you might want to memorize. It's, it's a little bit long, uh, but it's a great verse. This is what it says. Job 11, verses 13 to 18. Surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins. Uh -oh. Even those you do in secret. Then you won't be ashamed. You'll be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge. And your darkness, your darkest night, will be brighter than noon. Then you'll rest safe and secure, filled with hope and uh, hope and Emptied, I'm sorry, filled with hope and emptied of word. Ooh, I'm sorry, I got stuck because when I'm thinking about all of the things yeah. that we're challenged with, uh -huh. Uh -huh. if we would just do the first part, Amen. he's going to do the second part. Amen. Amen. See, see, I could have made this whole message around this particular verse and just read it and we could have been out of here. This is a whole message all by itself. There are three commands and eight promises in the verse. If you do the three things, he promises to do the eight. Right? It's really just that simple. If you do the commands, he's made some promises. Can, can, can I challenge you today? 
Take, take this verse and write it down on, on three by five cards this week. Put it on your vanity. Put it someplace where you're going to see it so that you can read it over and again. Because if you do these three things, you can expect God to outnumber what you do. Yeah. Amen. Amen. First things that I do is I, to, to live in God's love is every day I surrender my heart to God and I look for his benefits. Amen? Here's the second thing. Y'all all right? Amen. Step two is, is not only surrender, but step two, every day I have to remember. Okay. Not only must I surrender, but every day I must remember why God loves me. Amen. Amen. Woo, not only do I surrender my heart to God, but I must remember why God loves me. Jesus. You have to pause every day to remember the way that God loves you. Because see, here's the thing. If you don't feel loved by God, you're certainly not going to offer love to anybody else. If you don't feel loved, you're not going to be loving. It's impossible to be loving and not feel loved. Did you hear that? So I have to remind myself every day the way that God thinks about me. Not the way that the world thinks about me. Not even the way that I think about myself. I have to remind myself every day about the way that God loves me. And this will remove my fear. Let, let me give you a couple of things uh, that, that God thinks concerning you. Do you, you want to hear them? Yes. Yeah. Write these down if you're taking notes. Here's, here's one of the things that God thinks concerning you. I'm completely accepted. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know the way that God loves you? He loves you completely. You're completely accepted. That's important because the deepest wounds in our lives are caused by rejection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we spend so much of our lives trying to earn the acceptance and the avoidance of rejection uh, of our parents, of our peers, and, and those that we respect, and even perfect strangers, that we will ultimately end up transforming everything we do in an effort to please other people. But the reality is that God has fully accepted you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Woo. Just, just touch yourself and say, I'm fully accepted. There's this myth that says that I could, I could be perfect uh, before everybody else. But the reality is that you can be perfect before everybody else and people are still not going to like you. You can do everything right. You can do everything that they request and they will still. That's right. Not necessarily care too tough about you. That's right. and, and just so that we can keep that in perfect context, uh, Jesus was perfect. That's right. Come on. Come on. And, and, and the last I checked, he had a couple of haters himself. No matter what you do, uh, there's going to be somebody that's not going to like you. So here's the point. You need to realize the issue of acceptance has already been settled by God. Thank you, God. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 3, Verse number seven, Jesus made us acceptable to God. Yes. Ooh, if I had a real church, yes. would shout yeah. that would right there. Jesus made us acceptable to God. What Jesus did on the cross made us acceptable to the Father. God likes me, so what's your problem? All right. I'm completely accepted. Number two, I'm, I'm, condition, I'm unconditionally loved. Not only am I completely accepted, the second thing is I am unconditionally loved. Now that's, that's what God thinks about you. That's the way that God feels about you. He loves you unconditionally. There's a lot of things that I can say about God's love, but there's two things that I want to pull out about his unconditional love. The first characteristic of God's love is that it is consistent. In other words, God ain't fickle. God is not unpredictable. God doesn't say, I'm going to love you today, but tomorrow we'll see. Right. Not only is he unconditional, God doesn't say that I love you if. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Come on. Uh -oh. He doesn't say, I love you because. Yeah. Thank he you. says, I love you, period. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that, that should have been free right there. Yes. Right there for, for somebody. I, I, I love you in spite of the Thank fact. Hear here, here this. I'm, I'm going to read it so that I say it the way that, 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 that it's been written. So then this way you, can, you get this. Get this in your heart. Get this in your heart. Get this in your heart. You can't make God stop loving you. God will never love you more than this very second. 
And God will never love you any less than this very second. No one will ever love you more than God does. You never need to ask the question, will God love me today? You never need to ask that. He couldn't love you any more than he does right now. And he can never love you any less than he does right now. So there's nothing you can do. Because it's not based off of what you do. It's based off of what he did. Love is not based off of what you do. His love for you is based off of what he did. We always get ourselves into trouble when we doubt God's love. When we doubt that he loves us, we become fearful. Isaiah 54 and 10. Y'all all right? I'm sorry. I, I know, I know we, 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 we're kind of going through the weeds. But, but at some point this week, you're going to need to refer back to your notes. Amen. 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 Did, did you hear me what I say? Amen. We can shout it out, but, but, but I have a sneaky suspicion that somewhere in the week that's coming, you're going to need to remind yourself of some of the things that God is saying right now. So I, I, I got to sometimes take our time. It's raining. You couldn't do nothing out there no way. Hey, that's right. That's right. Anything you need to be doing. <laughs> Isaiah 54 and 10 says yeah. this yeah, <laughs> My love for you will never end Says the Lord yeah. I am completely accepted And I'm unconditionally loved Thanks. Isaiah 54 <laughs> and 10 Here's the third thing that God says about you I'm totally forgiven Uh oh yes. so, so, so why am I carrying the shame Why am I holding on to shame When I'm totally forgiven Do you realize that before God even made you, he had already known the worst thing you would ever do, and he still chose to love you. He knows the things that you're going to do before you do them, and he has chosen to love you. Because of what Jesus did for you, dying for your sins on the cross, I'm totally forgiven. Romans chapter 8. Many of you are wearing your why Jesus... Uh, uh, well, your Why Jesus t-shirts, do you know what it says on the back? Maybe you should wear it in reverse. Yeah, yeah, right, right. In Romans chapter 8, it says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Woo! Sins are wiped out. God doesn't rehearse it. He releases it. Amen. God doesn't rehearse your sins. He doesn't remind you. He doesn't say, you pitiful sinner, you. How could you do that? He releases them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Hallelujah. I, 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 I was reminded of this this week at the conference that we were at, and, and it was so wonderfully liberating. Amen. You are not a sinner saved by grace once you come to Christ. Amen. You are no longer a sinner saved by grace. You're a saint. Amen. Okay, can, 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 I, can I pause out of the, 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 the message for a moment just to establish this truth so that we stop ruining our relationships? Because, see, we're ruining our relationships because we are defining ourselves in a way that the Bible does not define us. And when you define yourself in a way that, that the Bible doesn't define us, then therefore you use the characteristics of your misdefinition. Yes, yes, are you with yes, me? amen. See, often we've had it perpetrated on us that we are sinners saved by grace. That was true. Once you get saved, mm -hmm. all right, Amen. you are no longer a sinner. You're a saint. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on, Pastor. Come on. Now, 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 you ain't an angel. Right. You're a saint. Mm -hmm. an, an, an angel does not have the ability yeah. to mess up and recover. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 If an angel messes up, there is no recovery. Yeah. Right. But you are a saint, which is by definition one who is saved by their sins. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to no longer define yourself as a sinner. Thank you. Because whenever you define yourself in your new nature as a sinner, you always use sin as a lens for everything you do. Wow. Wow. Yes. You default back to a setting that doesn't exist anymore. You don't need to be reminded. You don't need to remind yourself 
of things that you did, nor do you need to accept the enemy's reminder of the things that you did, because you are no longer that. You are now saved by, saved from. And in your new nature, you have the power to choose to not be anything he saved you from. The cross freed you from that. So when the sun says, free, it's free.
are two things. Who owns it? The value depends on who owns it. And the second thing is, what is somebody willing to pay for it? That's what determines value. Who owns it and what is somebody willing to pay for it? Who do you belong to? Who owns you? Well, let me answer that question. If you're a child of God, God owns you. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Here's, here's what the Bible says concerning you. You were bought with a price. You were paid for by Christ's death. Value depends on what somebody is willing to pay for. How, how much are you worth? If I was to ask you how much your house is worth, it's, it's probably not as much as you think that it is. It, it, it's only worth the amount that somebody is willing to pay for. Value is always established by the amount paid. The text says Jesus Christ paid for you with his life. That's how valuable you are. He, he, he paid for you with his life. So, so how do I remember every day the way that God loves me? How, how, how do I... Uh, uh, remind myself each day. Here's what you do. You, you get up in the morning and you say, God, I just want to remind myself how much you love me. I'm, I'm completely accepted and I'm unconditionally loved. I'm totally forgiven and I'm considered extremely valuable. We have to remind ourselves of that every day. This is the key to Relationships. There's, there's, there's the third and final things. I told you it was three things total. And, and here's, here's the last thing. Y'all all right? Amen. Last thing. We're going to write this thing out. Here's the third and the final thing that I have to do every day in order to live in God's love. I surrender. Okay. Yeah. I remember. And every day I offer. Offer. Every day I offer. I offer that same love to others. Uh-oh. Amen. Amen. It was good when I was talking about me. <laughs> but every day I have to offer the same love that God gives to me the Bible says I have to offer everybody else Ooh, every day I offer the same love to others That was the Bible says in John chapter 13 uh, verse 34 Jesus says this I'm giving you a new commandment to love each other Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Uh, beloved, it is not an option. It's not a suggestion. If you're a follower of Christ, you must love everybody. 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 I like that since we know where we're from. You must love everybody. Rather you like them or not. Yeah. Now let's talk just a moment. Oh, Lord. <laughs> the Bible says that all men will know that you are mine when you love one another. It says nothing about how you like them. An indication that you belong to me is in how you treat others. Now, let me just say this. And I'm get back to my notes, and, and we're going to close this out. The, the, the um, second core value that we're going to deal with um, is, is, is being faithful. But what are you faithful around? You're not just faithful in your relationship vertically. You have to be faithful in how you express that horizontally. Amen. See, and there needs to be an indication that you belong together. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a sign, and the sign is how you treat one another. Wow. Wow. Don't say you love him, but you can't love them. Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing worse mm -hmm. than church people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't nothing worse. Yeah. Ain't nothing worse. Yeah. 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 They make you itch. Uh, yeah. 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 They give you highs. Yeah. 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 Most yeah. church people act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They snooty and ain't got pot no Linda. It just makes no sense. You sit under the, the power of God and you didn't take none of it with you. Ain't no residue or nothing. 
Unfortunately, what has happened, and we've talked about this time and again, most people leave churches and they're the most hellish people you ever want to leave. They are so up in the clouds that they're floating on the tops of other people's heads. The text says, all men will know that you're mine. Not when you open your mouth and tell them. Come on. Yeah. But how you treat them. Right. Yeah. Uh -uh. Yeah. If I have to tell you I'm a Christian, I'm not. If I have to have some kind of sign or symbol, if I gotta have a vampire killing cross on me <laughs> and carry a 10 gallon bottle, and every now and again I just for no reason, like something just got a hold of me in public spaces. You, you don't know God. You know theatrics. Now, and I'm sick and tired of all of these church leaders. I ain't talking about people because you ain't doing nothing but what's modeled before. I'm talking about me and all my counterparts. Put it on the street. I'm so sick of y'all Negroes that could just throw it. Come on, yeah. Pastor. Come on, Al. Give it off an image as if you got it all together because you can quote it. Well, walk it out. Come on. Come on. If when people see you, they got to bow and curtsy, but you can't bend over and pick nothing up. You can't open up a door. You can't say a kind word unless they elevate you or say something. The front door. They're going to know us by our love. That's right. And here's the deal. Quite honestly, you're going to be tested not in the people who love you back. You want to show me how real you are? Show me how you handle people that don't like you. People who have nothing nice to say about you, who will roll their eyes as soon as they turn their back, and you know it. I'm not talking about people that you don't know that do this. I'm talking about the people you know were talking about you right before you walked up. How did you handle that? What did you say to them? And more importantly, what did you say about them when they left you? Yeah, Pimpin. Show me who you with. See, we were cool when it was all about transforming me and I'm getting close to God. But what are you offering up? What skin are you putting into the game? What are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of your relationship with God. Yes. Yes. Sure you could say it. Sure you could act. But that's just keeping you the way you always did. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That's not making you any different from anybody else. Thank you, Lord. What God is after. Is us being able. To express love. To everyone. Yeah. Not being selective. Because he wasn't selective when he came to you. Yes, but by the grace of God, there I go. The same thing that we can point out about somebody else's deficiencies, you are equally, if not more, deficient. And just because it may not be that thing that is presented right there in front of you, baby, that's a speck compared to the plank that's in you. And if I had time, I would talk about how Christians can walk the plank. You're not walking in love to the same degree that he has accepted me. I must accept everybody else. To the same degree that he forgave me, I must forgive everybody else. To the same degree that he loves me. Thank you, Lord. I must love everybody else. Can I pause 
again parenthetically and just say this, the reason why we get stuck on that sinner saved by grace and we are constantly contending and wrestling with sin is because we fail to recognize that if we don't get free from sin, we'll never free anybody else. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And since we haven't fully been freed from sin by our own theology, it's easier to look at the sins in other people's lives because looking at the sins in other people's lives make us feel better about the sin in our life. But the fact of the matter is that you are not a sinner saved by grace. You're a saint. So you need to stop dealing with sin at all. I will not crucify him afresh. I will not rehearse the sins. For what? Sin has one goal. Hell. Amen. 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 And unless I want to promote hell or I'm trying to go to hell, there's no need for me to even talk about anything that's related to it. I ain't going. And I don't want nobody around me to go. Because I cannot get to heaven and have God ask me, what do I promote more? What did I talk about more? Where was I more apt to focus my attention on the things that led to hell? Or the things that lead to heaven? Sin is sin. So what? Shut up. Now let's talk about how the grace of God Free you from it. You don't need to talk about what's already there. We're not trying to stay there. Right. Amen. We're trying to get free from there. And I'm going to live in the love of God, which casts out fear. I need to stop playing with things that promote the fear that keep me from God. Yes. Yes. I have to offer up. And that's in the way that I act. Not to people who are down with me. Not with people who feel good about me. Because where's the reward in that? Even sinners are good to sinners. Remember? I had more money when I was a sinner. So I could spend it on more sinful things. Do you know how much stuff I bought for other sinners? Yes. And enough to keep things flowing? Yes. There, was, there, was no, there was no hesitation. There was no interruption yeah. to maintaining things that ultimately led to hell. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. None. But it takes work. Mm -hmm. In an effort to be good to people that ain't good to you and your resources are limited at the same time, too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> So the, the only thing that I can afford to do is love you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to hold that? <laughs> I, I, I digress. Let's, let's get out of here. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just jump to the end. How many of us needed this message today? Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I, 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 I Thank can't you. express to you how important relationships are. Mm. And, and I know that this world has, has promoted this level of individualism, mm -hmm. self-sufficiency, yeah. mm -hmm. um, where, where, you know, when things don't look like or work out well, mm -hmm. then you are justified to go and be an island. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and I get that. Okay? I do, I, I was going to say I've done that. I do that. Amen. Mm. But it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it scripture. Right, right. I, I, I have no right to cocoon myself. Amen. No right at all. Because when God looked at me, he could have cocooned himself. Yes, yes, yes. But the Bible says that God so loved the world. That he, gave. that he gave. And he loved it at the worst time right. mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. 400 years of silence, and then his love broke forth. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Yes. Yes. 
for thousands of years, they had been cutting up so bad that God said, I'm not going to say another word until I get myself together. Because what I want to say, the last time we were here, there was war. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Our kids right now as we speak are at the My movies God. looking at Noah because God looked at the My world and said, God. Yo, My mother God. suckers. Right. Right. This is not what I had in yeah. mind. Yeah. And y'all are cutting right. off food. Yeah. And God yeah. repented himself. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I need you to understand that, that this is this is this is challenging. But just because it's challenging, it does, does not give you justification not to do it. Because in the same way that God repented after Noah, in the same way that he got himself together between the Old Testament and the New Testament, do you think that he would make that kind of a demand on himself and then allow us to get away with it? We have a responsibility. That's why Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another. All people, all men will know that you belong to me. Yes. 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 And the way that you handle your relationships. And we have to stop allowing fear to ruin our relationships. For perfect love, cast out all fear. So we need to get closer to God. We don't need to run from him. We need to run to. And in the process of running to him, I had to remind myself how he feels about me. Yes. I have to remind myself about what he did for me. And I have to display that. I have to offer it to somebody else. Because that's how I know how seriously I perceived it myself. Yes. By the way that I offer gives me an indication for how seriously I have received it. Mm -hmm. See, oh. I told you, come during the week. We can stop these messages in like 20 minutes. <laughs> if you really want to test how saved you are, listen, listen. If you really want to test how saved you are, see how willing you are to love someone who needs to be saved. Amen. 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 If you really want to test the 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 last the the, valicit, the validity. Of your relationship with God, be to someone else who you believe God has been to you. Yeah. Yeah. My, my. Yeah. I needed this message today. Amen. I needed to be reminded. I need to be instructed. I needed to be challenged to not allow any relationship to get away from me. Put it in proper context and to do my job. People gonna do what they do. Yeah, I don't have a responsibility for them. Amen. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. But I do have a responsibility mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. to me and to him. Yeah. So, yeah. so I want to close out with prayer. But just like last week, I, I, I want to challenge you in this prayer that if if this prayer is speaking to you, then I want you in your heart to say, me too. Okay? Amen. If, if, Amen. if you needed this message as much as I needed the message, Amen. then in this prayer, I just want to challenge you to own it. I want you to own the message, um, and, and as we talk to God, make the commitment to Him concerning it. Amen? So we're about to tie into heaven right now in an effort that He makes us responsible for what we said we just needed. Amen? Amen. Here's... Here's, here's our prayer. With heads bowed and eyes shut. Dear God, I admit that I have messed up many of my relationships. They're complicated. They're broken. They're not their best. I've often settled for less than the best, and they need to be transformed. God, I, I like you to begin by changing me. Yes. Deliver me from these three fears that I've learned about today. Yes. I can see how they make me distant yes. and defensive yes. and even demanding. Yes. Today, God, and each day from now on,
I want to surrender my heart to you. As a matter of fact, God, I'm doing that right now. I'm surrendering my heart to you. I want to learn to live my life in your love. Fill me with your love. Please replace my shame with your love. Yes. When I'm afraid to let others see the real me, remind me of how you see me. Yes. Thank you that you accept me completely. Thank you that you love me unconditionally. Thank you that you forgive me totally. Yes. Thank you that you paid such a high price to save me. Yes. Lord, help me accept others just as you have accepted me. Yes. Help me to love others unconditionally, just as you have loved me. Yes. Help me to forgive others totally, just as you have forgiven me. Yes. And help me to value others as much as you value me. Yes. God, I want to be known as a loving person. Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, I want to be a great person. Lover, So help me to extend grace to the people around me. Help me to express faith in the people around me. Help me to expect the best in the people around me. Help me to endure even the worst from the people around me when it happens. I want to live my life in love. And I humbly ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's children who prayed that prayer and accepted it personally said, Amen. 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 Perfect love. Cast out all fear. I'm going to love the hell out of somebody. I'm taking the responsibility based off of how he loves me. He won't put more on you than you can handle. Amen. So when it shows up, remind him. Increase my capacity, God. Increase my capacity, God. I can't love out of my strength. I can't love out of my wisdom. I can't love out of my resources. Exchange mine for yours. <laughs> So that I might be able to end this day with a well done. Not just my life, because sometimes that's too far off to think. Allow me to end this day with a well done. Give me the ability to love in such a way that when I lay my head down tonight, I feel your pleasure with me. I feel that you're pleased with me. Is that anybody else's request? Yeah. Amen. 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 And I believe transformation has hit the house. Amen. 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 Uh, did you hear something uh, that 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 you learned today? Did, did you identify something for yourself today? Okay. Here's here's his question number two. What kind of an investment are you going to make with what you heard? What are you going to do with, with what you identify? Can I challenge you, as, as we've been doing, before you leave the sanctuary today, identify something that you wrote down, something that stuck with you that you're going to own this week to do, that, that, that you heard something that, that, that God spoke to you today, and before this week is out, you're going to make that kind of an investment. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's all God wants us to do. Just bite, 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 bite. Amen? Amen. All right. Woo! That was heavy. Because I think we all got a little beat up today. Isn't that great? Coming to church and allowing God to be God. Amen? I told you something's happening. Well, now's the time where we get ready to go home. Um, so we have a couple of quick announcements that I need to make. Then we'll uh, give our benediction and we out of here. Amen. 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 Let me challenge you that if you're in a life group, please make sure that you uh, participate. Amen. Amen. Uh, have you been blessed by life groups? Those that are there? Amen. 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 So please.
please keep them in prayer. Uh, please keep what's happening here in prayer. Uh, and, 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 and think about how we're going to transform others when this series is done. I, I haven't really been, been pushing anybody and saying, hey, look, when you go and invite your relative or your neighbor, because right now we need to get ourselves together. Amen. 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 So we need time where we Amen. work on us. Amen. But, but understand, there's going to come a moment where we're going to stop looking at us. Amen. And we've got to go and show what God's been working on. Amen. 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 We have that responsibility there. Amen. Okay, so we have a, a, a couple of, uh, that's what I thought I was seeing um, happening, which is always good. Um, many of you all, well, maybe, maybe not, uh, so I'll just say it right now. We've been in prayer uh, for, uh, I guess I don't know the certain name of the family, but, but, but Anne.